The Great Pyramid of Giza, the oldest, the grandest of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The only one of these wonders to survive, bringing with it the dignity of age. The Arabs have a saying, the world fears time, but time fears the pyramids. In the 4,000 years since the Great Pyramid was built, a million and a half sunrises have cast their shadow across the sand. 200 generations have played at its feet, much like the children of today. History has etched its mark upon the face of the Great Pyramid. There are three major pyramids that stand on the rock outcropping known as the Giza Plateau. From this prominent position, they offer a commanding view of the Nile Delta, that fertile lowland stretching toward the Mediterranean. The last of these monuments to be built, and the smallest, is the tomb of a king named Menkura. Some 600 feet to its north, another pyramid towers above it. Larger and more impressive, it is the tomb of Menkura's father, Kefron. Part of the original casing still clings to its top. To the east, the Sphinx gazes toward the sunrise. Tradition speaks of hidden passages that might have joined the Sphinx to the second pyramid. Mystical worship is said to have found expression in these now silent monuments. To the north stands the oldest and the largest pyramid. The unanimous voice of its many visitors names it the Great Pyramid. Some say it was, like the ones that followed, a tomb for a presumptuous pharaoh. Others insist that it was not a tomb. Most do agree, however, and properly so, that it is connected with the reign of Kefron's brother Cheops, or Khufu. The size of the Great Pyramid is legendary. Enough stone to build a sidewalk clear around the world. Or pay the highway from New York City to Chicago or to construct 20 Empire State Buildings. The core of the Great Pyramid contains over 2 million stones, averaging 5,000 pounds apiece. Originally, it was overlaid with an additional 120,000 limestone blocks. These highly polished stones shimmered under the desert sun. Thus, the pyramid remained in its dazzling perfection for some 30 centuries, until Arab sultans in the 13th century pillaged the shining outer casing stones for the mosques and bridges of Cairo. Strong mortar filled the tiny joints, 
only one fiftieth of an inch, separating each casing block. Ferguson, in his History of Architecture, exclaims, nothing more perfect mechanically has ever been erected. The light of day never penetrates the inner passages of the Great Pyramid to illuminate the unique interior and the wonders of the structure. The entrance was known to only a few in Roman times. A hinged stone door concealed it so effectively that when its location was forgotten, no one could find it for centuries. The Caliph, Al-Mamun, looked for the entrance in A.D. 830. He searched the perfectly smooth exterior for any cracks that might reveal a door. Not finding one, he began tunneling where tradition said it should be somewhere on the north face. For three months, his men labored. Little did they suspect that the real door was only 35 feet above them. As they bored through the stone, they began to doubt. Would they ever reach a passage? Suddenly, the men heard a muffled thud within the building. They tunneled toward the sound. They broke into a steep, dark passage descending below ground. Torches in hand, they ventured down into this eerie passage that had been abandoned for centuries. As they reached its end, the passage leveled out, opening into a large room. A royal burial chamber? No. An unfinished dead end called the pit. Still confident of vast hidden treasure, they returned up the tortuous passageway seeking clues along the way. When they arrived near the point of entry, they noticed the large angular stone which earlier they had heard drop. Looking up, they saw revealed for the first time a huge granite plug. Try as they would, Al Mamun's men could not remove it. So they tunneled around the 15 ton obstruction. Another long, low passage stretched upward before them. Since it didn't have the cleats and handrails that helped modern tourists, they had to clamber on hands and knees up this cramped, slippery grade. At last they emerged. Before them, a remarkable sight. Continuing upward, a lofty hallway some 28 feet high, a grand gallery. Tunneling below this horizontally was another cramped passageway leading to a large empty room. The Queen's Chamber. They progressed upward along the Grand Gallery, ascending into the dark beyond the reach of their glowing torches. Faint shadows flickered on the lofty ceiling, and still the men climbed. At the top, a great step. A low stoop into an antechamber. Another low passage, and then the King's Chamber. But it was empty. To the right was what looked just like a coffin. At last, the treasure. They rushed to the coffin only to find it empty. Continuing their search, still another passage caught the Arabs' attention. Near the lower end of the Grand Gallery, a ramp stone was broken out as if by an explosion from below. It revealed a sharp vertical shaft which passed through a natural cave or grotto into the bedrock. Below the grotto, they followed a natural fissure and then angled toward a junction with a descending passage deep underground. The only treasures that Al Mamun found in the Great Pyramid were the curious passage system and the incredible workmanship of the ancient stonemasons. Seventy ton granite monoliths polished like marble in the king's chamber. Seven overlapping layers in the grand gallery. The high vaulted ceiling of the queen's chamber. The incredible accuracy of the descending passage within one fiftieth of an inch in 150 feet. 
What were the trade secrets of these ancient craftsmen? How did they build the Great Pyramid? Of all the ancient architecture that has captured the curiosity of modern investigators, that of the Great Pyramid is the most astounding. Many theories have been offered about the techniques used. In 1978, the Japanese Nippon Television Network, NTV, cooperated with Waseda University to try the theories by an actual test. They built a small pyramid in the desert near Giza. Their findings were aired in a 90-minute special program on Japanese television. August Tornquist was one of two American photographers granted special permission to photograph the Japanese project. The largest blocks of the Japanese cut were about one meter square, weighed a little less than three tons. Then they tried to drag them on plane skids, skids where the ramps were greased. They tried on pine tree logs. They tried uh, mud bricks made with straw. Then they put uh, a lime coatings on top of that to try to figure out how they possibly moved these massive stones in the pyramid and I'm sure that one thing the Japanese found out that it was not as easy as they uh, might have thought. Missing in the Japanese pyramid was the the fine work. There were no stones set in close proximity. Japanese used forklifts and cranes, all kinds of tongs and equipment to pick up these blocks. Many people came and would say, oh, the Japanese, they're cheating. And I would say to them, you're not cheating. If you ever saw the equipment that they used to machine and cut the blocks, you'd feel sorry for the Japanese and their <laughs> inferior equipment. We worked with the Egyptian workers. There were strikes in the middle of a pyramid construction. They worked for money, of and at the end, I thought that the Egyptian worker had become to have the pride uh, as a pyramid constructor. The main element of the pyramid construction in ancient Egypt was sand, sand and water and time and eternity and the faith in the God. And that is uh, the main part we learned from our pyramid construction. We used modern equipment and TV cameras. We didn't have any faith. We realized it when we were building the pyramid. We have only ambition to make a good TV program, big hit. That was our only energy. We didn't have any faith in God. One day I thought the uh, ancient uh, Egyptian had a big faith in God. Faith made them build the biggest construction in the world. The Japanese project contributes to the understanding of how the Great Pyramid was built but more questions remain. For example, the ramp theory seems inadequate and inefficient in a building the size of the Great Pyramid. To double the height of a ramp, it takes eight times as much fill material. Another unanswered question. How were the blocks lifted into place, especially the upper stones? The ancient historian Herodotus was told that wooden mechanisms were used to raise the stones. The Swedish engineer, Olaf Tellefsen, suggested that simple weight arms could have been used for pulling and lifting. Sir Flinders Petra, the famed Egyptologist, excavated much of the site, uncovering still more clues. The combined weight of these authorities suggests the following. First on the scene was the royal contractor with his architect named Philetus. He brought with him a corps of expert stonemasons, hired apprentices, quickly erected barracks that housed some 4,000 craftsmen. Excavations began at the limestone mountains across the Nile. Some workers cut stones from the bedrock and set them aside for transport. 
Others built wooden sledges. Others constructed dock facilities, weight arms, and storehouses for supplies. Expeditions brought wood, diamonds for cutting, and granite from Ethiopia. When spring came, the Nile rose, flooding 90% of Egyptian farmland. For three months, 100,000 workers were idled from normal farming activities. The royal contractor mobilized these men, broke them into teams of eight each, with an experienced stonemason to train the men. Other teams were taught the art of navigating barges on the wide river Nile. The gangs set themselves to the task. Each one adopted a name. Ancient quarry marks show names like the Endurance Gang and the Craftsman Gang. Using wedges, rollers, and levers, the men hauled the stones to the waterfront. Weight arms lifted the stones, which traveled in a sling to the barges. Across the river, the teams of finishing experts cut the stones and fit them into a broad causeway leading up to the building site. When the Nile receded each year, the gangs went back to their farms. The masons worked year-round, cutting, measuring, marking, storing the stones that had been brought over. They leveled the site and began cutting the deep passage underground to the pit. For ten years they worked on the road, the docks, and the site. Team spirit, competition, pride of workmanship, religious fervor, these all contributed to the intense activity. When the preparations were finally done, the major work of construction began. Returning each spring, the huge laboring force delivered 125,000 rough stones to the site. The finished stones from the previous year, each with a number to indicate its position, were moved into place. Each gang of eight men brought 10 stones across the Nile during their three-month stint. Each group of four masons finished an average of one casing stone per month, plus one core stone every three days all year round. Chips from the cutting were dumped over the edge of the Giza Plateau, extending it some 100 feet to the north. Some were saved as fill for beneath the wooden ramps. A special team planned the passages. Trial passages still in evidence were cut into the bedrock showing the planned arrangement. Granite monoliths were cut with bronze saws set with jeweled teeth. Rounded scraps of granite served as counterweights for the levers and saws. Outcroppings or bosses were left on the unfinished stones to hold props, levers, and slings. Sheet iron protected the softer limestone as the heavy granite monoliths were inched along with crowbars. They were rocked back and forth, so only half the weight was lifted at a time. Each new row began with the core. Then the casing blocks were lowered into place on a thin layer of cement. Once in place, the soft white stones were plain smooth. A lip and groove arrangement on each casing stone locked the rows together. If the capstone was placed, a special scaffold would need to be erected at the top of the pyramid. Peter Tompkins, in his book, Secrets of the Great Pyramid, expressed it well. It must have required the organizing capacity of a genius to plan all the work, to lay it out, to provide for emergencies and accidents, to see that the men on the quarries, on the boats and sleds, and in the masons and smithy shops were all continuously and usefully employed, that the water supply was ample, that the sick reliefs were on hand. If one takes into account the problem of quarrying, roughing out, transporting over two million core stones, and finishing some 115,000 enormous casing stones to a precision of one one hundredth of an inch, and then raising them into their correct place in a unified, polished structure, the mind boggles at the enormity of the effort.
Having considered how the Great Pyramid may have been built, still two mysteries remain. Who built it? Why? All of the other pyramids of Egypt were tombs, and although no firm ancient evidence exists, the tomb theory has always satisfied most students of the Great Pyramid. Frank Chaloux, author and lecturer, is one of the many archaeologists who are convinced that the Great Pyramid is not a tomb. The reason that the Great Pyramid is not a gigantic tomb is evidenced by the fact that when we do examine the coffer in the king's chamber, there are no inscriptions thereon, no embellishments, neither any on the walls, any hieroglyphs in honor of such a king and his deeds. And of course, historically speaking, there never was a body found, no evidence of that kind whatsoever. And we know that the sarcophagus couldn't have been drawn up its passages because the width of the uh, coffer would prohibit its being drawn along the passage system into this inner world chamber. And also, the peculiar fact is that there is no lid, nor were there any fragments of such a lid uh, ever found. This lidless coffer seems to suggest that this represents the chamber of the open tomb that this room is not a tomb of death, but a room of life, further corroborated by the fact that there are ventilating tubes bringing in oxygen from the outer atmosphere into this room. In other words, there's some other signification involved with regard to the reason for the erection of the structure. The suggestion that the Great Pyramid was not a tomb makes it unique among the other Egyptian pyramids. Unlike the others, which contain elaborate tributes to their builders, the Great Pyramid furnishes no such clue to the identity of its architect. Indeed, the only reference to the name of Cheops is a quarry mark scrawled by a workman on one of the concealed stones above the king's chamber. But if it was not a tomb, what was it? Many theories have been offered. Mystics claim that it was a temple of secret initiation. A few commentators believed it to have been a granary built by the patriarch Joseph, a refuge from another flood, or an astronomical observatory. Bizarre theories have arisen claiming that it sharpens razor blades, heightens consciousness, preserves food, and so forth. Today, books about pyramid power flood the bookstores with conflicting claims and contradictory reports. It would seem that the more one studies this ancient wonder, the more mysterious it becomes. Can scientific investigation shed any light on the purpose of the Great Pyramid? Modern explorers such as Jomard, Coutel, John Greaves, Dickinson, Lepsius, Howard Weiss, Piazzi Smythe, Flinders Petra, and Morton Edgar have surveyed and measured the pyramid. They dug for hidden passages. They measured every passage and chamber. They discovered original air passages to the king's and queen's chambers. Excavating the modern rubble, they unearthed the only remaining casing stones. They computed the height and debated the conflicting measurements of the base length. A startling new scientific theory emerged. In this theory, the pyramid's measurements teach principles of mathematics, geography, and astronomy. Mr. Jerry Leslie, a Portland, Oregon-based computer specialist, describes some of the scientific discoveries of the last 150 years. It is the scientist's role to discern truth from speculation. Like many areas of research, it is often the simple that turns out to be the most sublime. And yet it is so often overlooked. In the mid-1800s, John Taylor, a British amateur mathematician and astronomer, developed a curiosity about the Great Pyramid. He analyzed the measurements of Colonel Howard Weiss, who had just returned from an expedition to Egypt. Taylor was intrigued by the fact the pyramid faces were built at the odd angle of 51 degrees and 51 minutes. As he studied the measurements, Taylor made an astounding discovery. The height of the pyramid was mathematically related to the distance around the base 
in exactly the same proportion as the radius of a circle as related to its circumference. Taylor found that considering the height of this pyramid as a radius, the circumference of that circle would be the same as the perimeter of the base of the pyramid. No other pyramid bears this ratio. The pyramid had been designed to be a geometrical solution to one of mankind's most difficult mathematical challenges, the squaring of a circle. When Taylor published his findings, other astronomers, mathematicians, and explorers began investigations of the Great Pyramid to test his theories. These men uncovered many more facts about the pyramid, facts and proportions that indicate advanced scientific knowledge on the part of the pyramid builders. One of these points, the pi proportion discovered by Taylor, was later proved to be accurate to at least four decimal points. Yet it was 2,700 years later before mathematicians computed pi to that accuracy. And not till the 16th century was it computed to six and seven decimal places. The King's Chamber and Coffer also demonstrate that pi proportion. This is shown in the ratio of the length to the perimeter. A second point found by some of these men was that the cross section of the pyramid fulfills the famous golden section ratio, that is 1.618, which supposedly was not discovered until 1,000 years later by the ancient Greeks. This was found to be the exact ratio of half the base to the length of the apothem, that is the line from the mid base point up to the apex of the pyramid. Now let's take a look at a third point. Isaac Newton computed the sacred cubit of Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple and the Great Pyramid to be about 25 British inches. Sir John F. W. Herschel calculated that one ten millionth part of the Earth's polar axis would be 25.025 British inches. Herschel proposed this unit of measure to the world as being more accurate than the French meter which had been based on the curved line from the pole to the equator. Along came Taylor and Scotland's royal astronomer Piazzi Smythe and others with a startling discovery. The number of Herschel's cubits in the baseline length of the Great Pyramid is 365.242. That is exactly the number of days in a year. This was dubbed the Pyramid Cubit and 125th part of it was called the Pyramid Inch. Many other places in the pyramid reveal this special dimension. The Pyramid Cubit is so astounding because it is based on the axis of the Earth. Also, exactly 100 Pyramid Cubits form one side of the modern British acre, computed to be one myriad millionth part of the Earth's surface area. Satellite measurements during the International Geophysical Year confirmed Herschel's calculations. Therefore, the pyramid builders knew the size of the Earth more exactly than anyone else until the last 200 years. All of this and many more aspects of the Great Pyramid's construction indicate higher engineering skills than we knew possible in that age. But they indicate an even more advanced knowledge of mathematics geophysics, and astronomy. The scientific students of the Great Pyramid found themselves confronting another question. Where did the pyramid builders get their knowledge? Could God himself have dictated the blueprints, just as he did for Noah's Ark and Moses' tabernacle? If the pyramid was divinely engineered, they said, there should be evidence of more than just a physical understanding of the earth. There should be spiritual significance, possibly even prophecies of the future. The peculiar fact that the Great Pyramid is the only pyramid to contain an ascending passage system intrigued Robert Menzies. Perhaps, he said, the passage system was a symbolic diagram of human history. If so, important events and dates must be marked in some way. Since he believed Jesus Christ had brought a new age of hope to the human race, he called the Grand Gallery the Christian Age and placed the time of Jesus of Nazareth at its lower end. To test his assumption, Menzies looked for a time measuring system in the Great Pyramid. 
He tried measuring one pyramid inch to the year, and it worked. With that method, the passage system clearly marked the important Bible dates, such as the birth and death of Christ, the Ten Commandments, the Flood. John Herschel had already calculated the date of the pyramid's construction from astronomical evidence. Imagine Menzies' surprise when two unique lines in the descending passage were found clearly marking that exact date, 2140 B.C. The strongest supporting evidence was that whether he measured forward from 33 A.D. or backward to the descending passage, both passage systems ended at the same date, 1914, a major turning point in modern history. These discoveries attracted many enthusiasts to the study of the Great Pyramid. Some went to extremes. After reading of the irrational theories and outlandish claims of some pyramidologists, it is understandable that the academic community would lampoon the whole subject. But the basic evidence is still there, and it must be explained. Again, Mr. Shalou. Many people are impressed with the Great Pyramid because of its gargantuan size, that it's a mountain of masonry. People wonder why I have given lectures for the past 30 years, why I wax so enthusiastic about this structure. It's because of its sacred symbolism, that it's a structure that has an important meaning, that it is referred to in the Old Testament scripture as a sign and a witness unto the Lord. When I read such passages, namely as this one, that in that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord, and it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, I see this as somewhat of a challenge, that here the Lord is telling us something, something uh, somewhat mysterious, and yet of note, of value, that this altar is to be situated in the land of Egypt, in its midst as well as at its border, and that it would be a witness related to the God of the universe, and that it would be for a sign, that is, it would have some story to tell. The meaning of Isaiah's curious prophecy remained hidden until the last century when map makers noted that the Great Pyramid, located as it is in the geographical midst of Egypt, is also at the border of Egypt in two ways. First, it was in the village of Giza, Arabic for border. The Giza or border plateau marks the boundary between the ancient divisions of Upper and Lower Egypt. Second, the Great Pyramid's diagonals mark the natural boundaries of Egypt's pie-shaped Nile Delta. This connecting link between the Bible and the Great Pyramid led investigators to look for more supportive evidence. One striking fact discovered by Morton Edgar was that the odd pyramid passage angle, 26 degrees, 18 minutes, 9.7 seconds, when placed on an equal projection map, exactly passes through the city of Bethlehem. The number of years from the pyramid's construction to the birth of Jesus is indicated by the distance to Bethlehem, using the base of the pyramid as a measure. Another fact. The king's chamber, with its coffer standing in its western end, is very similar to the tabernacle of Moses, which had a rectangular ark in its western end. The cubical contents of both boxes are the same. The walls of Moses' tabernacle contained 100 square cubits. There are exactly 100 stones in the king's chamber. The sanctuary of the tabernacle was entered by ducking under a veil supported by four posts. The king's chamber is entered by ducking under a portal containing four semicircular grooves. If the pyramid was related to the Bible, who built it? The evidence is sketchy, but etymologists have noted that the ancient form of the name of Cheops is very similar to the ancient form of the name Shem, Noah's eldest son. According to the Bible, Shem lived 502 years after the flood, 
or more than 150 years beyond the building of the pyramid. Herodotus recorded a popular belief that Cheops was assisted by an aged shepherd named Philetus. One tribe of Shem's descendants were called Philistines, a group of nomadic shepherds who migrated from the Nile Delta to Gaza. Another curious fact sheds light on the pyramid's builder. Cheops reigned 50 years, followed by his brother Kephron, who reigned 56 more years. This would be highly unlikely in a family of normal lifespan. But the reign of long-lived Shem, followed by the reign of his brother Ham, would harmonize with Egyptian and Bible records. This would also agree with modern scholars, such as Lepsius, who considered the Great Pyramid to be non-Egyptian in its origin. Scientific insight, engineering excellence, links to the Bible, a non-Egyptian builder, all these facts led to another theory, that sometime in the third millennium B.C., after God told Noah how to build the ark, and before he told Moses how to build the tabernacle, he told Shem, or a contemporary, how to build the Great Pyramid. If the Great Pyramid was intended to preserve a biblical message, why has this mystery been kept hidden so long? Surely the builders must have had some idea of its purposes. Why have all generations of recorded history believed the Great Pyramid to be the world's biggest mausoleum? Another discovery of this century suggests an answer. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs have been unearthed and translated. They reveal symbolic titles for each passage and chamber. The titles of each passage read like a symbolic prophecy of the past and future. The descent, the chamber of the ordeal, the well of life, hall of truth in darkness, hall of truth in light, chamber of regeneration, chamber of the open tomb of resurrection. Carl Hagensick, a Bible lecturer and publisher of religious books, sees the ancient Egyptian inscriptions as hints of a very detailed symbolic relationship between the Bible and the Great Pyramid. The concept of a resurrection is one that is distinctly Judeo-Christian in its origins. Therefore, when we find reference to resurrection in these ancient Egyptian inscriptions, it places the Great Pyramid symbolic story somewhat similar to that of the Jewish Messianic prophecy of the Old Testament. Now there's another theological point that is peculiar to the Hebrew and the Christian tradition, and that's the concept of the fall of man, or his descent, in some ancient time. Genesis speaks about the first man, Adam, that he disobeyed God, that he plunged the entire race into a hereditary downward course. And this idea is also picked up in the ancient Egyptian inscriptions. Now, they call the entrance passage the descent. But today, modern man doesn't have to rely on ancient Egyptian records for his knowledge of God. Perhaps the most ancient, and certainly the most reliable source of religious records, is recognized as being the Bible. And when we compare the Bible to the Great Pyramid, it's amazing to see just how closely they correspond. For instance, the Bible speaks of the ultimate destinies of men, and it speaks of them as though there were three. Now, the Great Pyramid has three chambers, three ultimate destinations. Each of these three in the pyramid is arrived at through a passage structure. Each of the destinations in the Bible is arrived at by what the Bible calls a way. These three ways in the Bible are described as the broad road that leads to destruction, the narrow way that leads to life, and the highway that leads to holiness. Men, by very virtue of their birth, find themselves slipping and sliding on a descending course, on a broad road that seems to lead straight to destruction. And man has always sought some way out of this, one of the earliest things that promised to be a way out goes back to the story that's told in the Old Testament about Moses ascending to the top of Mount Sinai and coming down and 
offering the law of God to Israel. At that time he told them, if you keep this law, you will live. If you disobey it, you would die. Here was a way that seemed like it could bring life. But it didn't take Israel long before they found that they were incapable of keeping that law. For the very simple reason that that law was uh, totally perfect. It represented God's divine standard, and that was something above their abilities. And so much later, the Apostle Paul wrote, the law which we thought to be unto life, we found to be unto death. Notice how beautifully that's illustrated in the Great Pyramid. The first thing that branches off of this descending passage is this ascending passage. And in the ascending passage, uh, one notices that it is very low. You have to stoop over, illustrating you are in bondage. But beside that, you can't really even get into the ascending passage, except for this forced entrance of El Mamun. The ascending passage is totally blocked by a big chunk of granite. And it's interesting to note that in the pyramid, you only find granite two places. You find it here in this chunk, and you find it in the very uppermost chambers, which show things heavenly or divine. Here it shows the divine standard of God that man was not able to keep. But after nearly 2,000 years passed, there was a man who did keep it. In fact, it was his keeping of that divine law, that standard, which showed him to be the one qualified to be not only the Messiah of Israel, but the Savior of the entire world. Jesus Christ, by his life and his death, is said to have opened up a new and living way that leads to life. And it's this new and living way that Jesus himself described when he said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. It's this narrow way to life that is pictured in the grand gallery leading to the king's chamber picturing heaven itself. Now, one might look at that grand gallery and said, how does that picture the narrow way to life? It's far from narrow, it's very high, it's very lofty. The grand gallery pictures really two different aspects of the Christian's walk to the early Jewish Christian especially. Uh, they found it to be uh, a way in which they could stand up. They called it the freedom that is in Christ because they were contrasting it to the bondage of the law. Every mistake they made was something by which they could be judged as worthy of death. But in the law of Christ, there it was a judgment that was based upon their heart intention and not the actual deed. And so it's this liberty aspect that is shown in the loftiness of the Grand Gallery. But don't let the loftiness fool you. That Grand Gallery is hard to walk up. It is narrow because there are steep ramps on both sides. It's steep and it's slippery. In fact, I, I doubt whether one could easily walk up at all if it were not for handholds that are planted along these side ramps. And these handholds so beautifully represent the assistances which Christ gives to his church. And one almost has to think that the designers of the pyramid designed it to picture this. Because planted over each of these handholds is the inset of a cross. At the end of the way, he comes into passages that are all of granite, showing that the achievement of the Christian, if he is faithful, is to have the very nature of God and of Christ himself, the divine nature. But one of the beauties of the Bible is that it does not speak of everlasting life only for the Christian. It speaks of life for all mankind. And this life for those who are not Christians is beautifully described in a prophecy in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter 35. It tells about a time when the earth itself will be made perfect, when the desert shall blossom as a rose, when the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped when the tongue of the dumb shall sing, when the lame man shall leap as a heart. And it says at that time that a highway shall be there and a way. It shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean will not walk over it, although it will be for those. And it's this highway of holiness that is illustrated in the pyramid by the road that leads from the juncture of the Grand Gallery over to the Queen's Chamber. The Queen's Chamber picturing this perfect life upon the earth. You know, the Bible does speak about God when he made the earth. He formed it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. 
the Bible talks about a kingdom that will be upon this earth. And it's that kingdom which is the terminus of this highway of holiness that leads to it. But again, one looking at the pyramid might say, well, that passage hardly illustrates a highway. That looks like a very low passage. And in fact, for most of its distance, it is. You'll notice as you look closely, however, that the latter portion of that passage is much higher than the earlier parts. In fact, those who have measured it tell us that exactly one-seventh of the passage is high enough for a man to walk in. The first six-seventh he has stooped over. Here again is a beautiful illustration of this highway. The plan of God as outlined in the Bible is 7,000 years in length. And the latter 1,000 years is what is described as the kingdom of Christ. Now we've looked at almost all of the passages in the Great Pyramid, but there's one we haven't touched, and that is the passage that we call the well shaft. And what that path illustrates is what the death of Christ does for men. At the top of that passage, it's almost like an explosion took place, opening the passage up, uh, showing that when Christ died, he opened up the way both for those who would be of his bride to come to a place where they could walk the narrow way and to bring back those of mankind from the grave so they could walk the highway. Christ has provided a way of escape. Now, for those of his church to go up the narrow way to the king's chamber picturing heaven and in his kingdom, along this horizontal passage, a highway that will lead to holiness of life here upon this earth. The study of the Great Pyramid, which began as a look into an ancient artifact, becomes an investigation of the most momentous themes that concern the human race, the issues of life, purpose, origins, and destiny. Edmund Jesuit, an award-winning design engineer who relates the Great Pyramid to his interest in science and the Bible, expresses it this way. I believe the Great Pyramid could properly be called the Bible in stone. Now, what is the theme of the Bible? It is the life and the work of Jesus Christ. And that work has two parts. The first part is redemption, dying that man may live. The second part is restoration, giving that life to the world for all to benefit from the redemption. And uh, the Pyramid depicts both parts not only in the passage system, but in other ways as well. Now in the pyramid, the well shaft pictures the redemptive work of Jesus, providing a way of escape from the pit of death to the chambers of life. The Bible calls Jesus the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now notice how strikingly the pyramid points to Jesus as the Lamb. In the well shaft's grotto, there's a natural rock formation projecting from the original bedrock. And this clearly resembles the shape of a lamb's head. Now this remarkable rock formation was there before the pyramid's foundation was laid. And the Bible says that Jesus was the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world. There we have Jesus in his work of rescue for a dying race. But another feature of the pyramid, its overall shape, illustrates what will happen when the benefits of redemption reach the entire world. The Bible describes a future government of the world. And in this government, the leaders will be unseen, they'll be in heaven, and their influence is going to extend down to this earth. It's going to be a universal dominion. Even victory over death itself being achieved by resurrecting all the men who have ever lived and teaching them God's laws. And the Bible illustrates this government by the shape of a pyramid with Jesus as the capstone. The prophet Zechariah speaks of the top stone, David of a headstone, and then Jesus speaks of himself as the rejected stone that will become the head or the chief cornerstone. The Apostle Paul describes a government of the world in his letter to the Ephesians. 
in which the whole creation will find their one head in Christ, both things in heaven and things in earth. If there is one thing that has united the human race down through history, it is the tragedy of suffering and death. And if there is a second thing, it is the universal hope of a better day. This hope was not merely a human imagination. No, it was encouraged by our Creator in various ways as the Bible unfolded. And I believe it was etched in stone when God inspired the builders of the Great Pyramid. Poets, philosophers, and prophets have long expressed the profound desire of the human soul for peace and brotherhood, harmony with God, and an end to death. Now, the Great Pyramid, which to the casual observer symbolized the shape of the ancient past, becomes something else under the Bible's light. It becomes the shape of things to come. After 4,000 years, the Great Pyramid has lost little of its ancient wonder. A city was built with its casing stones. The city fell. But the pyramid has survived. Earthquakes shook the foundations, but the pyramid survived. Conflicting theories continue to swirl around the Great Pyramid like sandstorms in the desert. However, man has now been given the key that unlocks the pyramid's mystery. This key is the same mathematical language that enables us to measure the universe and unlock its secrets. The size of our world, its land area, its distance from the sun, its astronomical relationships, the timing of its journeys. Not until modern man had learned these facts from the measurements and proportions of our solar system could we read these same facts in the measurements and proportions of the Great Pyramid. Unfortunately, the newfound knowledge of 20th century man has also produced an attitude that scoffs at ancient wisdom. And so for many, the message of the Great Pyramid is hidden behind a door that has been unlocked by knowledge, but remains closed until an awakened interest challenges the theories of the past. To those who open that door, the Great Pyramid quietly reveals its message. Whoever built the Great Pyramid, it continues to display a degree of technology which is in many ways superior to that of our present industrial age, a fact that is a real challenge to the evolutionary theory of the steady progress of man. We stand in awe, humbled before the builders of the past. Material success only underscores our terrible failure to bring an end of suffering, poverty and distress to billions of our race. In our perplexed and troubled world, the Great Pyramid, man's oldest building, and the Bible, his oldest book, give evidence of a creator who knows our need, whose love and care transcend time and promise to touch the life of every man.